This is the neck of a 35 year anniversary Strat. These were made in Fender's custom shop between 1989 and 1991. And only 500 of these were made. Unusually for a Strat, it has an ebony fretboard. It's got a bird's eye maple neck, although the bird's eye, bird's eye is not particularly exaggerated on this guitar, just some bird's eye along here, but almost none along this part of the neck. The owner of this neck has asked that I don't identify which of the 500 it is, but you can see it says there has a number of 500 with the, the Fender Custom Shop logo below. So why has this neck come to me? Well, a previous owner of this guitar has done something quite unusual to the neck. So this would have been originally a nine and a half radius, nine and a half inch radius, and they have removed the frets and flattened the fretboard. And I think probably sort of trying to create a compound radius, but haven't done it particularly well. So it's, it's a 20 inch radius there and then it's not, I'm not quite sure what that is. Then we're back to 20. And then as we move down the fretboard, we're now down to sort of 16 inch radius. Yeah, I'll call that 16 there. Yeah, so 15 at the 11th fret. Yeah, and we're still a, a 14 inch at the fourth fret. And yeah, just about at the third fret. <laughs> but then it, it jumps quite a lot. So by the time we get to the, the second fret, and certainly that the first fret, we're now at the original radius of 9.5, uh, but quite a jump between the second fret and certainly the, the fourth fret. The owner of this guitar wants me to return it to its original condition, which is with a nine and a half radius fretboard in ebony. So that requires taking off the, the fretboard and making a new fretboard. If we look at this walnut plug, we can see that it's damaged on either side of the plug itself. And this is really common on strats. If we take a typical 1 8 Allen key and insert it, and then try to adjust the truss rod nut either direction, it is gonna bind against the side of the, the walnut plug, either damaging the, the finish or damaging the plug itself. And if we go in with a longer Allen key, we can see that the, the truss rod nut is sitting about there along the length of the, the neck. So this does make it very difficult for owners of strats to adjust the truss rod on their guitar just to see what's going on or maybe they've gone in with a metric Allen key rather than imperial and in doing so have stripped out the, the inside of the truss rod nut. So the owner of this guitar wants me to take out this plug and replace it and repair the finish to it. Now you may have noticed this, I've taken out the, the dot mark at the seventh fret and you can see a screw here. And I just wanted to confirm that this neck has a Fender Biflex truss rod system. Now the Biflex truss rod system was introduced by Fender in the early 80s. Most truss rods are straight and sit below the fretboard, but the Biflex truss rod is in a curved channel. And Fender found that when the truss rod was adjusted so that it pushes that way against the bottom of the neck, it could push out the walnut, walnut strip with explosive force. Uh, which would be pretty devastating, I would think, if that was your, your guitar. Um, and so they introduced this truss rod retaining device just below here, which holds the, the truss rod in place, but doesn't allow for excessive force against the walnut strip. Now, the owner of this guitar has got a very similar strat neck, and he decided to have it x-rayed. And it's fascinating to see these two x-rays. 
In the first one, you can see the truss rod running through the neck and the location of the truss rod nut. It's also interesting to note the, the side markers of, of different lengths. I guess they're just, just pushed in and then clipped off. And then in the second x-ray, we can see the curve of the, the truss rod. We can see the truss rod retaining device, which sits below the seventh fret, fret marker. And you can also see how close to the bottom of the neck the truss rod runs. I think Fender say that there's no more than about an eighth of an inch, sort of three millimeters or so. So something to think about if you're ever thinning down uh, a strat neck. I'm going to start by taking out this walnut plug. And that'll just take any tension off the, the neck when I take, start to take the fretboard off, but first of all, I'm just going to score around the plug where it meets the red of the rest of the headstock. Just so when it pops out, it doesn't take out chunks of the finish when it comes out. The next thing I'm going to do is just heat up the walnut plug. This is glued in, so I just want to soften the walnut plug just to help it break free. This is quite a large length of metal, so this may take some time to heat up. Yeah, the walnut plug feels quite warm now to the touch. So I'm just going to give it a go. This is a, a Stumac gripper rod. So as I back out the truss rod nut, it then moves against the back edge of the plug. Okay, I think I'll just go in, go in with some more heat. Okay, I can see it just starting to move now. Here it comes. Yeah, that one was a little more reluctant to come out <laughs> and has become a little damaged in the process. Uh, but I have a replacement one of these. And there's an important washer that I just want to keep there. That since sits against the, the truss rod nut. And there is the nut, which actually looks to be in excellent condition. There's always a danger when you take one of these out that, well, it's a danger. Sometimes you see they've been rounded over inside and you can't see that from the outside looking down the channel, but that one is in good condition. The next thing to do is to take off the, the fretboard, uh, which as I say that, it makes it sound like it's a straightforward process. But before I do that, I'm just gonna take out this screw, which is supporting uh, the truss rod retaining device. And 
I'm now ready to remove the fretboard. I'm just using a, a domestic iron just to heat up the frets and in doing so the frets will then just transfer the heat through to the underside of the fretboard and soften the glue. Just need enough heat but not so much heat that I'm overheating the neck and causing any later problems with the neck. So it's a job that I'm just going to take really slowly and not f force this neck off. And I'll be using a, a variety of different tools and what I'm trying to do is get this fretboard off with as little damage as possible to that join between the maple and the, the ebony so, so I don't uh, crack a lot of lacquer along this edge. I mean, I will do some, but I'm just trying to do as little as possible just so that I can minimize the, the touching up that I need to do. And uh, as you work the underside of the fretboard, I find that you know, some areas just come, a, come free quite easily and other areas are just really, really stubborn. I just do not know, uh, you know quite how long this is going to take me until I start working it. This feels pretty solid to me. Just what I didn't want to find at the start of this process was a problem right at the beginning here. So you can see just two metal pieces here. Now I, I don't think they, they look like sort of broken off screws that have come through from the back of the neck, but I don't think they are. I suspect what they are are two locating pins, just so when the, the neck is put together, the fretboard sits on here, and then it's all in, in the right place. But as I'm sliding my spatula underneath, I could feel that I was hitting these. And uh, so the best thing to do was, was just sort of cut off the end of the, the fretboard so I can get past these. The other thing I'm finding is that the spatula slides under here and is lifting the fretboard away from the maple neck. But on, on this side, what's happening is that the, the grain, as I slide under, the grain is, is going that way. And it's so the fretboard is breaking away ra rather than being able to sort of slide under the fretboard and separating the, the fretboard from the neck. But we'll keep going. Progress update. This is a right pain to get off this fretboard. As I slide in on this side, I can slide in and it lifts and it separates from uh, the main body of the neck. But as I slide in this side, as I sort of mentioned earlier, the grain in the neck on this side seems to be going up like that. And so as I slide in, however, whatever technique I use to do that, the fretboard just cracks and it cracks in a sort of diagonal line. So I'm not able to get underneath it along the plane of the neck. So what I'm having to do is periodically take out a fret, slice it through, cut off that section and then start to start again. And hopefully I'll get to a point where the neck is the fretboard is separating from the neck in the same way it is on this side, on on both sides. But at the moment this is just taking just way too long to to get off. But that's the the nature of removing a fretboard. You never know quite how it's going to be until you start work on it. I think this neck is now finally coming off, as I hoped it would all the way through this process. Just for, for some reason, this side of the neck, the base side, it was easy to separate. But the treble side was extremely difficult. But now both sides seem to be equal in terms of how the fretboard is coming off. So I just need to make sure that after the frustration of the last hour, that I don't overdo this now. and. Um, damage the, le the lacquer in my enthusiasm to finish this job. Oh, 
those little cracks are, are good noises. Just when I thought this was going to come off in a matter of minutes, it's now cracking that way again. So let's um, have another rethink. It appears that <laughs> that crack wasn't a good noise. It was actually the fretboard cracking that way. I'm just going to take this last bit slowly. <laughs> Mind you, the whole job has been slow, but I don't want this to just suddenly, the fretboard to suddenly pop off. That said, I don't think that's going to happen. I think this fretboard is going to fight me right up into the nut. I don't know what glue Fender were using in the uh, sort of 90s, I think it's a 1990 guitar when this was made, but it seems to be impervious to the application of heat. It seems to make very little difference in terms of softening it or, or separating the fretboard and the neck. This fretboard has indeed fought me right to the very end, right to the nut. If anyone knows what, what glue Fender were using in 1990, I'd be interested to know. Um, or any suggestions about um, how I might have done this differently. I mean, you know, you can use steam, which sort of helps to sort of separate glue joints, but I was reluctant to, to do that. Right. I didn't really want it popping off at the end like that, but anyway, I think there's no, no damage done. That was not an easy job. One of the things I was trying to avoid when removing the fretboard was to damage the, the lacquer where the maple meets the, the ebony. And actually the fretboard has come off remarkably cleanly. I can't really see any damage along that side. And maybe just a tiniest little bit of lacquer has come away there. Which I can touch up. So yeah, very happy with that. I'm now ready to make the fretboard. The fretboard on this neck was an ebony fretboard. And this is a piece of ebony here, a very black piece of ebony. You can see I've had this since 2012. So I've had this a long time. And the reason for that is for the guitars that I make, now I generally like to use colored ebony, such as this, which I find a, a lot more interesting. But the owner of this guitar has just asked that the colour of the ebony be similar to what was on there originally, not surprisingly, and so this is the piece of ebony that I'm going to use. When it comes to shaping the fretboard, the ebony fretboard, there's one aspect that I had to consider and think about quite how I was going to tackle this. And that's because past the nut, the fretboard actually splays out on both sides, more so on the bass side than the treble. So the fretboard is not straight along its complete length and I perhaps see that a bit more closely, a bit more easily here. So this is a template that I, I've made 
and you maybe sort of see against the black the black background this sort of this area here where the fretboard just goes outwards so what I decided to do was make a template that reflects that shape so if I get this wrong it's easier to make another of these than to make a mistake with the the ebony fretboard because then I just have to start again and I haven't got another piece of ebony that's quite as black as this so this allows me to just get this right and in fact I, this is my second attempt the first one wasn't quite right so you know yeah, I, I learned from the first first one I made made of these rather than learning from the ebony fretboard it's also allowed me to shape this template so that it is just a tiny bit wider than the uh, fretboard actually needs to be and that's because of the curvature of this c-shaped neck so if i make the fretboard or the template the exact width there that i have on the maple neck what i'm going to then have is a sort of 90 degree angle just going up there whereas in fact i just need to make it uh, so that I can just profile this this edge here and maintain that curve as it goes up to the, the, the top of the fretboard. Quite hard to explain, but I, I know what I mean. So I, I'm just going to be able to work that, that area uh, when I sort of do the final shaping of the fretboard. Uh, and the other consideration I'm thinking about is how do I do this so that I can shape the the neck so that it feels correct in terms of how it feels on, on your hands you're playing whilst doing as little damage to the the, the finish the, the lacquer when I do my sort of final shaping so that's my thought process at the moment um, yeah I hope I'm going to be successful in that The next thing I need to do is to recreate this shape on the underside of the new fretboard. So this is where the walnut plug slides in. Now obviously this, this hole is drilled as part of the manuf manufacturing process. The hole is drilled not along the line of the fretboard, along the line of the neck, but is drilled at a slight angle, which is why that shape is then created. So I think what I'm going to do, having sort of thought about this, is to work this line here with my Dremel tool. Now this is a, a 10 millimeter sanding piece that I have here. The actual plug is slightly under, it's about 9.8. So I need to be careful that I don't make this part too big, because so there's a, quite a gap when I, when I place the fretboard over the top of the the plug 
And so the last bit will just be some final shaping with a small file just so this then sits perfectly over the top of the walnut plug. Anyway, that's my thinking, so let's see how we go. Before I go on, it's confession time. I made a mistake. I'd completely forgotten about this little grub screw that sits under the, the seventh fret dot marker and connects to the, the truss rod system, the Biflex truss rod. So I had to drill out the seventh fret marker and just make that hole a little deeper, just so it would take this screw that then connects onto the, the truss rod system and then I'm going to have to put the, um, the dot marker back in place once the fretboard is glued in place. Fortunately everything lines up. Um, I don't know how I forgot about that but that's just how it is. It's an unconventional fretboard but um, no damage done actually. I've shaped the walnut plug using an oscillating spindle sander to create this curve. And I think it's a lot easier to do this prior to gluing the fretboard in place. It just allows me to get the, the shape as close to perfect as I can. I think if I, if I was to do it at a later stage, I'm more likely just to damage the, the finish around the plug. But um, yeah, that's ready.
fretboard has been radiused to nine and a half inches and has been sanded up to 500 grit. And in a discussion with the owner, we've agreed to go for fret wire that's 2.65 wide and 1.2 millimeters tall. The original specification for this guitar we think was just medium jumbo fret wire. So I think sort of 2.65, 1.2 tall is about right. Not overly wide, not overly tall. And this fret wire is nickel as original rather than stainless steel. Incidentally, I would say that about 80% uh, of the refrets I do now are in stainless steel rather than nickel, which seems to be the way it's going nowadays. The next part of this repair is to replace these side markers. Now this part of the repair does present a number of challenges. If I was to go straight in with a, a 2.5 millimeter drill bit, because this is a curved surface here, the drill bit is going to have a tendency just to wander around this area, it really is a sort of flat surface to, to bite into. So what I'm going to do is progressively go in with larger and larger drill bits, starting with a, a 1.5, then a 2, and then a 2.5 millimeter drill bit. Another issue is the actual location of these side markers. So if we look at this marker at the third fret, the center point appears to be at the point where the fretboard meets the maple neck. So that, that dot marker now, the new dot marker, is sitting directly over the existing dot marker. But if we look at the dot marker on the 21st fret, we can see that the center point of the dot is not at that point where the ebony fretboard meets the, the maple neck, but just below that. So if I place a dot over, yeah, it's just below. But then if we look at the two dot markers on the 12th fret, hopefully the camera can pick this up, but this dot marker is sitting slightly further up, you know, towards the, the ebony fretboard than this one. How Fender managed to achieve this in the manufacturing process, I do not know. I can't believe this was, these dot markers were drilled by hand, but what I'm looking at certainly suggests that the the vagaries up and down the fretboard markers are where the dot markers sit, suggests that these dot markers were drilled by hand. So what to do? Well, I'm going to make the center of my dots the same as they are up here, the center being just below where the fretboard meets the maple body. And that way, where these dots sit slightly lower, hopefully the location of the new holes will cover some of the, these vagaries. But I'm gonna start up at this end of the fretboard. So all the side dot holes are drilled and actually this has gone a lot better than I hoped. I think the locations of these dots in relation to how much they're going to sit into the, the, the fretboard looks pretty perfect to me. I think, I think I've also improved on the, the 12th fret here 
That looks better. The dot markers are now in place. Yep, that all looks pretty good to me. The it's slightly raised, uh, more so, more so on the maple side. Uh, so I need to just address those so they sit flush with the surrounding finish. But doing that in in such a way that I don't sort of damage or cut into the the surrounding finish so much. And eventually I'll just give these a light um, amber tint with an airbrush just to sort of colour them so they look look more like the originals. Okay, so this job is now finished beyond putting the guitar back together. Without doubt, this has been the most difficult repair I've ever had to undertake. There's been quite a few challenges associated with this neck and this repair. So as I reflect on this job, I'm just thinking about to what extent someone picking up this neck, would, it would be obvious to them that major surgery has happened on this guitar neck. You know, what are those clues that might indicate that something has happened to this neck? Well, if we look at the, the fretboard and the frets, well, they're absolutely pristine. You might think this, this guitar has had very little play since it was new, but the, the, the frets are, are perfect. But maybe someone might conclude that this guitar has been re-fretted because there's nowhere on the frets, considering the age of the guitar at all and the, the fretboard is, is not showing anywhere at all. That, that said, ebony doesn't really show the wear that you might see on rosewood. Under the hand, this guitar feels absolutely natural. The transition between the, the new fretboard and the rest of the neck feels absolutely natural. So under your hand, there'd be no clue as you were playing this, that this guitar has had some work done to it. And for me, this is one of the most challenging aspects of this repair. To what extent, well, lifting the fretboard was, as you will see, it was, was really difficult. But to what extent, as I lifted the fretboard, that I was able to preserve the existing finish? Quite honestly, if I was to do this type of job again, I would not attempt to blend the, the fretboard into the existing neck. I would strip the, the finish completely because it's really difficult to blend this in without getting any step along this edge. That said, um, you know, one of the reasons I did that, well, the main reason I did it was because I needed to preserve some of the, the Fender Custom Shop detailing just here and also the reference to the, the, the number in relation to the 500 that were made of this, of this guitar and the detailing here. It might be possible just to strip and then refinish this part of the neck, but blending new into old and getting the, the tone exactly right is really difficult to impossible. So it would have been obvious that there's something has happened. So that's why I went down that route, but there was a lot of challenges associated with that. So any other sort of telltale signs of this neck has been worked on? Well, I think if we look at the, the walnut plug here, you can see that actually it's, it, there are some signs there that something has happened here that the, maybe the, the walnut plug has, has been replaced, but it's not overly noticeable. Replacing the, the side markers, the dot markers, has gone well. They look, well, I don't think anyone would, would really sort of think that they've been replaced. As you know from the earlier part of the, the video, there was some interesting challenge I had to overcome in relation to the location of these markers and the, the regular way that they had been fitted and installed. But um, yeah, happy that, that looks good. So I think it's now time to put this neck back in the body and put a, a new set of strings on. <laughs> 